speaking at conferences. In fact, this is my first. So forgive me if I don't live up to the expectation of me. Um, I'm usually talking to warehouse people and farmers and importers and uh, people in the food industry where you can look uh, to scavenge food. In fact, you are looking at a scavenger if you never knew what one looked like. Uh, I'm at the other end of the spectrum that I think most of you are talking about, the academic, uh, the practical nature of agriculture. I'm out there to say, it's there, how do I get it? Um, so we're going to talk about hunger, and I'm going to put a face on what we're talking about. I have a question, uh, an informal poll. How many of you out there would like to go? Raise your hand if you would not like your paycheck this week. Well, how many of you would not like your paycheck for two weeks? A month? Two months? Well, that's in the news right now, right? We have 800,000 U.S. government workers not getting paid. They now have gone a month and two paychecks uh, without any money. We are being called upon to help feed those people. On a daily basis, we're getting calls to feed TSA workers, to feed federal prison employees. So we have the future and we have the now, and I am stuck in the here and now. We have 40 million people that we are trying to feed in this country. And where is, oh, right here. So Feeding America is trying to feed 40 million Americans. 12, 12 million of those are children. Almost 5 million of those are seniors. And we know that if you are not eating, there are many functions that you cannot perform. Our ability to learn, if we think about Maslow's hierarchy, and the stages we need to achieve before we can succeed. Think about that, a child. Is the child going to learn in school if they're hungry? The cognitive development that they must go through? The social and behavioral parts of hunger. So if a child is on federal free stamp program, is he being or she being ostracized because of it? Santa Fe, New Mexico is the first city in the nation to propose a law for, um, against bullying because of hunger. These are very real and present issues that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. The physical component, of course, is natural. If you can't build the proteins in your body, then how can you perform physically? And then family health. We know that the food that we rescue isn't optimal uh, when you when we get breads and cakes and cookies and donuts. Um, it's food and it staves off hunger for a little bit, but it's not optimal. So Feeding America has a goal by 2025, so 25 years ahead of what we're talking about here, to collaborate with many institutions, government, agriculture, uh, manufacturers, how can we get enough healthy uh, foods to feed uh, our clients, our 46 million people? Feeding America is an organization that has 200 uh, food banks uh, throughout the United States in every single state. I don't know if we, I can't claim this, but I think we're probably one of the only organizations that touch every single county other than UPS and the federal uh, mail system. So pick a county anywhere in America and know that Feeding America through its representatives are feeding people in that county. I'll go back to this because that means we're, we're feeding 60,000 food pantries and meal programs throughout the country. So one of the things we're talking about is the inequality of uh, food distribution. I think um, Timothy said, how do we build a sustainable future? And then Robert said, 
how do we make it equitable? So if we're feeding 40 million people and there's 72 billion pounds of food out there, how, do you, how does that make sense? We have enough food, right? Well, it's a matter of where it is and how we get it to where it needs to be. The EPA has a structure in which they uh, recommend and how food should be optimized in terms of rescuing. So if we can find if food that can reduce the waste stream, let's rescue it, let's feed hungry people, after that, let's feed animals. After that, let's go to the industrial uses. How can we process it into maybe oils or uh, digestive material that we use as compost? Um, and then last but not least, hopefully not going to the landfill. So Feeding America in 2007 rescued about 1.4 billion pounds of food. In 2017, we rescued 3.3 billion pounds of food. About 60% of the 3.3 billion uh, pounds of food, excuse me, let me go to my notes here. Uh, that's why I brought up my computer. Um, so about 60% of that um, was rescued through grocery stores um, manufacturers, uh, and the like. We partner with, as I said, many people in the industry, retailers, grocers, manufacturers, farmers. And I'm, I'm giving this, I'm setting the stage here. I know I'm talking about technology and food. But I just want you to give the lens in which we're looking th uh, at the food rescue industry. We are seeing consumer trends now fresher demand, you have the, the boxes that are sent home, Blue Apron and such. Um, manufacturers are getting more efficient with their manufacturing supply, more nutritious food is being produced. We, are, we're, we keep hearing about going to the outside of the aisles of the grocery store. Um, what does that mean to us as Feeding America? That means we're getting less food than we used to, so we have to be resourceful on how we find food. So. Key areas that we look to are farms, which have about 20 billion pounds of wasted food, manufacturers that have about 2 billion pounds, and consumer-facing businesses, 50 uh, billion pounds of food wasted. So that equals the 72 billion pounds of food that we find that was being uh, wasted in our country. So we have to do several things here. We have to demand plan. Rather than react, we have to plan. We have to find efficiencies that can help drive this for us. The transportation crisis, I don't know if it made your psyche and what's happened in the last year in transportation, but a truck that went from California to New York a year and a half, two years ago, was probably $6,000. It's up to $12,000 now. So if you want your produce from California in a New York bo bodega, you're going to have to pay for it. Um, so what Feeding America, one of the approaches we are looking at and has been funded, we're starting co-ops for a loose term uh, in eight regions throughout the United States to address local needs. Uh, we can't address everything out of the Chicago office, so how do we do that? We start looking at other models that say, if we can create regional structures in which address the needs of that region quicker, maybe this is a way. So we're about half a year into this. So what are we doing? We're trying to aggregate a view for all our members. What is your demand? What do you need? Um, and to give you an example, we could talk about feeding hungry and we could say, well, in New Mexico, there's pinto beans, right? And we have all these split beans. They're not good. Uh, we can't put them in the can, so we have truckloads of beans we want to donate. Well, you try to do that in New Mexico, and they won't take them because you have a cultural uh, part of this that says, you know what, when we sort beans, we take out the splits. We don't want splits. We want the whole bean. So even though you have the food, you have the cultural component to it that says we're not going to use it. Um, the Navajo Nation, 
don't take eggplants there. They won't use them. Um, so we're trying to understand those gaps. There's also ca capacity constraints. How do we get food uh, from here to there? Um, if there's no refrigeration at our agencies. So these are some of the issues that we're, we've been um, put forth that we have to deal with. One of the things we've done, um, there's an organization called Accenture. They came to Feeding America with a grant and they helped us say, okay, how can we map out patterns? And so one of the things we've done, and I wish I could show this map live, but it's an interactive map. All the, and I'll get to the, this is the technology part of this, and I'll get to another part called Produce Matchmaker. Produce Matchmaker, we have offerings of food. And we've taken all that data and put it in an interactive map that we use, and this is one component of that interactive map, and this shows all the food that we've moved in a year, last year. And you'll see some patterns emerge. Anybody want to take a guess what's going on with the blue lines? If you look at that in the United States, um, wh where does that look like it's terminating from? What's in Washington? Apples. So we have uh, sourcing up in Washington. Uh, we talk with our apple growers consistently and constantly, and our pear growers, and anything that's available for donation, those seconds. Um, the market falls out and they can't move them. Well, we'll start transporting those. I could click on one of those lines and it would say, this is the day we move the load, this is what, how we moved it, this is the cost it, for the product, the cost for the um, transportation. Um, so it may say $3,000 for transportation, but it'll also say it cost $1.73 a mile to move that. Um, and then to the food banks where the uh, end point is. So our largest area for uh, looking for food, of course, is the supermarket. Uh, we have trucks in all of our food banks that go to every supermarket, Walmarts, Targets, Pro any Kroger-affiliated stores, and almost on a daily basis, we have trucks going to these stores rescuing any produce or any other food that is either deemed not saleable. Um, Restaurants, we have 14 billion pounds lost. That's a, a difficult area to do because that's fresh food and you need to transport it in a either warm or have it frozen for later use. And that's just a hard uh, logistics to, um, to cover. So one of the things uh, we do is say, okay, how do we get a local organization the local food bank to access that food from the retailers. And one of the things we've created is something called Meal Connect. Meal Connect is a software based platform. Um, it allows agencies to log into a system um, or uh, get a text message or an email. It's a push model. Um, donors can go online, they can post a product on the Meal Connect app. And in real time, say I'm, um, say I'm General Mills, and we have trucks that are going all over the country, and for whatever, that, that load is rejected. They get on the app and they said, this, this is rejected, here's the local food bank, and they just push a button and the local food bank gets a message. General Mills has a load of cereal for you. Do you want it, yes or no? And some of us are calling it the uh, food app, uh, the Tinder food app. Swipe left for yes, swipe right for no. Um, and what this allows is a quick turnaround for the donor so they don't waste time about having the truck on the road, spending gas and time with the driver. It allows the local food bank to say, hey, we have an opportunity to rescue some food. Um, and what's neat about this is if the local food bank says no, then a concentric circle builds out and it finds the next closest location that would be. And then they have either five minutes, 15 minutes, an hour, whatever we designate that time. So we're starting to say, 
We're not your food pantry that you think about where you just go in and get your can of ravioli. We're actually starting to use technology to help us make a more efficient uh, logistics program. Uh, we are now starting to spread this out beyond the major retailers. General Mills is one of our first uh, uh, major corporate customers to work with us. So this was made eight months ago, and it says we rescued 720 million pounds. Well, it's over a billion pounds now. So just in three months, this is outdated. Um, so we have 100, we have even more than that now. I think we have 140 food banks using Meal Connect out of our 200. We have over 2 million pickups. Uh, we have 4,800 agency partners that are working with this app and um, 20,000 donors. So we're building upon this, and it's actually probably one of the coolest parts of what we're working on right now. This is what I call Produce Matchmaker. So Produce Matchmaker is a software-based platform. It's uh, also platform agnostic, Android, phone, tablet, doesn't matter. You can get on this. Um, donors, I, anybody could go up and say, hey, we have a truckload of zucchini from a local California uh, grower. Um, we want to put it up on Matchmaker. Uh, we'll put the data up there, and it will say the item type, the variety, the pack size, and it just gives all the details. It's all sortable. You can sort by weight. You can sort by cost, available date, you name it. Um, and again, we have uh, parameters on there. We can set regions. So if that California donor, uh, we don't want that to go to New York, then we can have a 500 mile exclusion or a thousand mile, whatever we think. You know, if it's a hard squash, then we can leave it open for the whole country. So Produce Matchmaker is our platform that we're using to uh, help get more donations. It allows, uh, it allows a food bank in, say, LA or Orange County to put up an offering that maybe Colorado would never have seen you know, three years ago. So what does that mean? So, what, so Produce Matchmaker, we took all that data and we started looking at where produce is and, uh, and how it moves. And this is kind of one of the most interesting things. I've been working on this project called the uh, Port and Border Strategy. Uh, it's something that I don't know if we're all aware of, but 52% of our fruits are imported into the United States. About 41% of all our vegetables are imported. And the USDA says that within 10 years, that's going to be about 72% of all our fruits and vegetables will be imported. So we're farming out our own uh, food sources outside of this country. So the way I look at it is, well, if that's going out of, uh, out of uh, our country, it's coming back you know, across the border somehow, and we better find ways to rescue this coming through the border. Nogales, Arizona is our first pilot project. It started just about four months ago. About six billion pounds of produce comes through the Nogales port of entry. Um, second to McAllen, Texas, where about 6.2 billion pounds of produce come in. So when that product comes in, it comes across the, through inspection, comes across the border, and then once the border uh, receives it, it goes into cold storage. Then brokers are working their magic. They're on the phones, they're talking, they're trying to move that product. If that product doesn't move for whatever reason, the cold storage owner is telling the, the owner of the product, get it out of here, I've got strawberries coming in, get it out. And they're like, no, 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 I'm gonna lose my money. And th they said, well, then donate it. Well, that local food bank in the Gallus, Arizona can get up to 20 to 30 truckloads a day during high seasons of donated produce. And the food bank in the Gallus, Arizona is about as big as this room. Think about 20 or 30 truckloads of vegetables coming through here. So what this data through Produce Matchmakers showed us is who's ordering what, when, and where. Then we created a demand plan. So the answer to everything, in my mind, is logistics. Um, 
you have to make it happen. So in order to make things happen, you say, okay, how do we get the transportation out of Nogales to these other locations? So our pilot project is the solid lines right now. We are moving product from Nogales to Wilcox, Arizona. That allows El Paso and Albuquerque to make day trips to Wilcox to pick up that produce and back to their territories. There they can feed their hungry from there. Likewise, Phoenix uh, is our uh, window to Las Vegas, Reno, Boise, and Salt Lake. The dotted lines are saying, well, if we're successful with the solid lines, next year we'll hit the dotted lines. Um, the way we're answering that is the network's own transportation. So in order to, for this to happen, we have to understand something. The trucking industry is short 50,000 drivers. So for every load that comes out of Nogales, for every truck driver there's a, in Nogales, there are 30 loads that are going unclaimed. In fact, we don't have, have that many drivers. So is autonomous trucks one of the solutions? And we've been approached by an autonomous truck company to say, we want to start running some of these lanes for you to see if it works. So to get to that kind of um, poll that we ran at the beginning of this, what is your favorite technology? Despite all the improvements we've made, I think I would have to say people. You know, the opposable thumb gives us a lot of options. And as people, we have the ability to think a little bit better so far <laughs> than technology. And it is actually the feet on the ground that make the difference. And I'll give you a couple examples. So on my way um, here, I found out a friend died uh, four days ago. His name is Country. Well, that's, his name is Francis, but he goes by Country. He's a Vietnam vet, and he was a food sourcer uh, out of the San Antonio Food Bank. That one person fed hundreds of thousands of people by sourcing food himself. And he said, Andy, the technology I use was my mouth and my car. And he said, it's the relationships that I built with them, the trust that I built with these people that brought the food in to uh, feed these clients. So you can have technology, but you need that, you need that human component and the boots on the street. And if you have ever gotten a hug of thanks, especially from a 70-year-old woman in Las Lunas, New Mexico, then you realize the hunger issue that we're working on is more than technology, it's more than trying to solve all the components involved, but it's a real human issue. And that hug, to me, gives me more motivation to do what I do and what we do as Feeding America than, than what we're gonna do in 25 and 30 years from now. As I said, I'm stuck in the here and now. Thank you. <laughs>